the lunchtime news now on BBC One with Peter Sissons. A day of parties and pop as the Jubilee festivities gather pace. And the day even has a theme song. India and Pakistan at the same summit, but the Kashmir tension rises. And with the fans crying out for tickets, why are so many World Cup seats empty? Good afternoon. It's party day across the UK as people join in a bank holiday of celebrations for the Queen's Golden Jubilee. Tonight's pop party in Buckingham Palace Gardens is going ahead despite the fire inside the palace yesterday. The Queen herself has spent the morning in Windsor watching a big parade and a short time ago launched the BBC Music Live festivities. A 41 gun salute for 50 years. A suitable trigger for a celebration of tradition and the official start to the day's festivities. For the Queen, those began in Windsor, where a short drive past fluttering flags led her to a parade, remembering cultural movements throughout her reign. But if the hippies didn't bring back pleasant memories, the country dancing certainly did. Then, a walkabout to meet some of the 15,000 people who'd gathered to watch. A few minutes later, and the Queen was in neighbouring Slough, where, with the aid of a golden metronome and Dame Kirite Kanawa, she set in motion a nationwide rendition of the Beatles' anthem, All You Need Is Love. London this morning the soldiers were marching to a different beat preparing for thousands to gather outside Buckingham Palace where tonight's pop concert and fireworks display will be staged some flag wavers spent the night sleeping behind the barriers well I come here because the Queen's had a sad year because of sister and also the Queen Mother now we've got to uplift the Queen lift up the country I just love it here the people are wonderful here and I'm like really looking forward to these um, spectacular events Behind the gates, a Cliff and S Club go through their paces. Tonight's party at the palace is going ahead as planned, despite yesterday's fire. The cause is still being investigated. Today's business as usual it should still be a great party. I mean, we're still planning on 12,500 people over there this evening for what should be a fantastic concert. So, undeterred, London and the country prepares for its golden moment. Robert Nisbet, BBC News. And our royal correspondent, Jenny Bond, is in Slough now. Jenny, I take it the, the palace fire hasn't put a damper on the Queen's enjoyment of these special few days? No, I think there's a clear statement by the Queen and the Duke this morning that the party goes on, the Jubilee goes on, in spite of the fire, in spite of the rain. There was a capacity crowd here, some 12,000 people packing out the centre of Slough. Uh, the Queen herself is said to be relieved, of course, that no one was injured in the fire, relieved too that the damage was pretty minimal. Scaffolding's going up outside the palace, uh, around the damaged area. The firefighters are trying to pinpoint the cause of that fire. And one tip that I learned this morning is they were helped in fighting the fire by the big screens inside the palace. Uh, the cameras zoomed in on the area that the flames were coming up through so that the firefighters could direct their hoses. The Queen is going to go and see that damage for herself, of course, at some time, but we're told uh, probably not today. Now, Jenny, take us through the highlights of the day still to come. 
Well, this is going to be some party in the palace. Uh, everyone's hoping, of course, the rain holds off, but even if they get drenched, I think, the 12,000 people in the gardens this afternoon are going to this evening are going to have the most wonderful time. I got a tiny taster of it last night, late at night, half past 11, trying to get home, trying to get a taxi. I was walking around Buckingham Palace and the sounds of Sir Paul McCartney singing Hey Jude and Eric Clapton were reverberating around the whole of the city. It's going to be a really wonderful evening and of course it's going to be broadcast live on the BBC. Jenny Bond, thank you. Well, as you can gather, throughout the country people are taking part in all sorts of jubilee activities, including parades, processions and galas. But the most popular community event is the street party. And this lunchtime, the many weeks of planning and preparations are starting to pay off. A head start for this red, white and blue bash at Bedminster near Bristol. From first thing this morning, cars were being kept out so children could have the run of the streets. What's the party for, do you know? Uh, for the Queen's 50th year the at the Queen. Queen. Yeah. Right. The grown-ups here say it's taken a lot of planning. We started in February, so it's quite a lot really. But uh, it's going to be worth it. Hello, boys and girls! There's been just as much organisation in Northern Ireland. Like so many of the planned events across the country, this one is being built around children and fun. The Jubilee is, is a big event, uh, obviously happening throughout the United Kingdom. It's proper that we in Bangor should be putting on the, the biggest show of all in Northern Ireland. In London, the trestle tables are also being dusted off, ready for a day-long bash to remember. At this one in West London, they're expecting 100 children and 300 adults. They did the same thing all over again in 1977 for the Queen's Silver Jubilee, but this time they're promising it's going to be bigger and better than ever. But some others think they can top that. At East Garston in Berkshire, they're holding a competition for the best-dressed Golden Jubilee house. So how much the residents have spent months sense. preparing, attaching anything with a British or royal connection to the sides of their buildings. A sign for many that the foundations of monarchy are as strong as ever. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News. And Catherine Marston's at a street party in Sale. Catherine, how's it going? What's on the menu? <laughs> Well, Peter, this is uh, Pine Grove in Sale, and uh, everybody's very excited here. Juggins the Clown is here, the banners, the balloons, and the bunting are all up. There's about 70 people live in this street, and they've spent the last few months raising the £600 they're going to need to put on this street party. There's all sorts of things happening here, juggling, fire-eating, there'll be races later on, and there's also some saints paint here. You can go in and have a, a quick look there at the Union Jack being painted on. And uh, everybody here has spent, as I say, months and months fundraising for this. It's, it's not cheap. It's over £100 just to insure a party like this. And, of course, everything else costs money, too, to get all the balloons and all the, uh, the stuff together. And there's food and drink as well. Everyone is very, very excited. They've worked very, very hard for this. And uh, this is a street that's very well known for its street parties. It had one back in the Silver Jubilee. And there was an egg and spoon race. And this street became pretty well known because somebody broke their arm and their leg in that street, in that race. And... Uh, everyone's hoping that that won't happen here again. They're all looking forward to it. The celebrations kick off in about half an hour. Peter. Ka Catherine, thank you. And let's hope we have a bit of blue sky. Football supporters at the World Cup finals have complained that it's almost impossible to buy tickets to watch the games, but many stadiums have had thousands of empty seats. Now, FIFA has begun an urgent investigation with the tournament organisers. They're thinking about letting fans in free to stop the ticket touts from making a killing. The Saitama Stadium, England's opening match and the stirring sight of around 9,000 England fans cheering them on. Less gratifying, the empty spaces, gaps in the crowd when so many others who've travelled to Japan would have given almost anything to be there. Utter, utter disgrace it really is, it make, makes you sick that, that there's football fans outside grounds and there's football fans all around this city and, and in, even, even outside each game that are just desperate to get into that ground and there's so many seats here and they're just empty. It's, it's, it's shocking, it really is. I tried for about six months, I've been like going on the website like every other day trying to get a ticket and no luck at all, no luck at all but I ended up paying £200 yesterday for a ticket outside the grounds. FIFA said there would be no ticket touts at this World Cup. They were wrong, of course, but even the touts have struggled to get their hands on all the unwanted tickets, while the FA were only given 3,500 in the first place. The allocation is restricted by FIFA. 
we sold our allocation as we've done throughout the World Cup. It's a relatively small number of tickets and we understand the difficulties that some fans have. But I'm afraid the situation is that that is the allocation that we get as a country and it applies to the other 31 associations as well. Not all games can be filled. Paraguay versus South Africa in Korea is a bit of a lost leader for the organisers. But when the attendance for the big matches falters, something's going wrong. Well, these tickets may be like gold dust to England fans, and virtually every game England play over here will be a sellout. But that doesn't mean that every seat's going to be taken, particularly by the Japanese. And there's absolutely nothing FIFA or the FA can do about that. And it's an awful long way to come if you've got no guarantee of getting into a game. David Eads, BBC News, Japan. And on the field, there's been plenty of action. Brazil have made their first appearance of the competition. After conceding a surprise goal to Turkey, striker Ronaldo brought the Brazilians back into the game. Rivaldo sealed a 2-1 win with a penalty three minutes from the end. The Turks had two players sent off. Croatian Boris Zivkovic became the first player in these finals to be shown the red card after conceding a penalty to Mexico. The Mexicans duly converted the spot kick, which was the only goal of the game. And the much-fancied Italian team took only six minutes to open their World Cup account with the first of two Christian Vieira goals against Ecuador. They're currently 2-0 up with most of the second half left to play. Meanwhile, the England coach Sven Joran Eriksson has told fans not to give up on their team after yesterday's disappointing performance in the one-all draw with Sweden. And he's promised a much better performance this Friday against Argentina. Daniela Relf is with the England World Cup squad in Japan. Daniela. Well, I have to admit, Sven Joran Eriksson couldn't hide his disappointment today. He admitted that during the second half yesterday, his team had completely underperformed. On the positive side, he confirmed that David Beckham had not aggravated his foot injury, although he is tired and lacking in match fitness. The England captain, though, will be ready to lead the side against Argentina on Friday. A disappointing performance on the pitch hasn't dampened the passion for England here. Training was a quieter affair and it began with a pep talk. The message from the manager would have been clear. Yesterday's performance wasn't good enough. I'm not happy with the draw. I'm not happy with the second half we did. But anyhow, we have one point and uh, everything is open and uh, I think we go through the group anyhow. Despite the optimism when Sweden equalised yesterday, it was a different story. From Ericsson, there was a rare show of frustration. The next game against Argentina was always going to be a test of this squad's mental and physical strength. None more so than David Beckham, who needs to last the full 90 minutes this time. It's a match which now takes on even greater importance. England's World Cup survival could depend on it. There's no doubt that Ericsson expects more from his players. The problem is they now have just four days to put things right. Peter. Thank you, Daniela. Three people are being treated for gunshot wounds after sectarian rioting in East Belfast last night. Their injuries are not thought to be serious. The clashes were the latest in a series of disturbances in the Short Strand district. Houses in a loyalist area were petrol bombed and many residents forced to leave their homes. The leaders of India and Pakistan are facing growing international pressure to hold talks to try to ease the tensions over the disputed territory of Kashmir. A recent escalation in violence means about a million soldiers are massed on either side of the line of control which divides Kashmir between the two countries, both of which have nuclear weapons. The Pakistani leader General Musharraf and the Indian Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee are both in Kazakhstan this weekend for an Asian security summit. But Mr. Vajpayee has already ruled out any face-to-face -face talks with General Musharraf on Kashmir. Our correspondent Jonathan Charles is at the summit in Kazakhstan. Jonathan, the two leaders must know they have to talk at some stage. What's the sticking point? 
Well, there's certainly intense diplomatic pressure and diplomatic activity here, Peter. There's no doubt about it. Most of that pressure is going on India, and at the moment, India is, is really the sticking point. The Indian Prime Minister has said again today there's no question of a face-to-face -face meeting with the Pakistani president. He says that can't happen unless Pakistan cracks down harder on Kashmiri militant groups who, uh, India says, are operating from Pakistani territory, carrying out attacks in Indian-administered Kashmir. That's the big sticking point from the Indian point of view. They want Pakistan to take a much tougher line against groups which uh, Pakistan uh, says are freedom fighters and India claims are terrorists. Now, that's the area where the diplomats are concentrating on, seeing if they can find any common ground to bring these two sides together. So what's the attitude of the, of the, the other nations there, the peacemakers? Do they think they will persuade them to talk? Well, they certainly want them to talk. This is a summit taking place here of Asian nations. Many of them are just a few hundred miles from the borders of Pakistan and India. And they certainly don't want any conflict over Kashmir. They're worried that if there's a nuclear conflict, then some of that nuclear radiation could come their way. After all, just behind me are mountains and only 500 miles away is Kashmir. So it's near enough to be a real problem for the Asian nations. And they are very keen that there should be much more friendly relations between India and Pakistan. But I think at the moment, the chances are slim. Jonathan Charles, thank you. Here, police in Hampshire have taken the unusual step of naming a man they want to question about the discovery of a dismembered body. The remains of Tristian Lovelock were found in different places on a housing estate in Basingstoke on Friday. Police want to talk to Richard Markham about the murder. They say he flew to the United States on the same day. Navdip Dariwal reports. Ruth Halliday struggled to contain her grief as she pleaded for help in trying to find the killer of her son, born in 1977. This weekend, the Golden Jubilee, 25 years later, Tristan has been violently and horrifically taken from me in the prime of his life. Parts of 25-year-old Tristan Lovelock's body were found scattered around this housing estate in Basingstoke. His head had been severed. Other parts of his torso were discovered at a local park, just yards from a children's playground. Hampshire police want to question this man, Richard Markham. It's just been confirmed that he'd taken a flight out of Heathrow to New York on Friday morning. Now there's an international search underway to find a man police say shouldn't be approached. The circumstances of this particular murder are frankly beyond my experience. Um, and it's true to say that they're actually beyond the experience of anybody who's been associated with the inquiry and that includes um, the Home Office pathologist who conducted the post-mortem on our behalf. The horrific nature of Tristan's murder has left local people shocked and two young children fatherless and devastated. Navdip Dariwal, BBC News. Now the really important stuff for the bank holiday, the weather. Here's Helen Willits. Peter, I think we've seen the best of the weather so far for this extended holiday weekend, but it's not all doom and gloom. The main change is how it will feel out and about. That sticky air now across the continent, 20 degrees, the top temperature here means it will feel much fresher than the weekend, and uh, the change certainly happened with a bang. Look at the array of thunderstorms first thing this morning. They've moved out into the North Sea now, but it's this band of cloud and rain which has caused the umbrellas to be raised in Cheshire and Slough, as you saw earlier on, but it's brightening up behind as well. So, as I say, mixed fortunes. We'll start to see that rain continuing its progress northwards and eastwards. But after that dry morning for Northern Ireland, the showers start to arrive and they'll push further into the northwest of England and Wales this afternoon or this evening, eventually chasing that rain out and allowing some sunshine to come through in eastern England once again. But the main change is how cool it will feel, particularly if in the rain. But even with some sunshine, 18 or 19 will feel fresher. Now, if you're lucky enough to be heading off to the party in the palace, it is going to be much cooler this evening. Take something warm with you. And after a cool evening, it'll be quite a chilly night as well, but mostly dry away from the north and west with those showers, that area of low pressure close by. But by morning, perhaps the increased risk of some clouds spoiling the sunshine and bringing a few spots of rain into southeast England and East Anglia, not amounting to a great deal tomorrow. Most of the unsettled weather will be further north and west. Temperatures really as today, though, up to 80 or 19 given some sunshine in places. Peter. Helen, thank you. More now on the main news. The celebrations for the Queen's Golden Jubilee. More than 1,600 beacons are being lit across the world. One of the first, and perhaps the most poignant, is in Kenya. The young Princess Elizabeth was staying there at the Treetops Hotel when she learned she'd become Queen. The British Army has marked the occasion by climbing Mount Kenya, which overlooks treetops, and lighting a beacon on one of its summits. Our correspondent, Andrew Harding, joined them.
Daybreak on Mount Kenya, and a golden jubilee mission like no other. A team of British soldiers is climbing up Africa's second highest mountain to light a beacon. Mount Kenya is right on the equator, but it's so high there's snow on the summit all year round. At long last, the summit and the beacon. <laughs> Time to toast the Queen with a glass of port. Ladies and gentlemen, we are standing for Her Majesty the Queen on a special occasion, the Golden Jubilee. The Queen. The, queen. the, queen. the, queen. the, queen. the views here are breathtaking. They also have something of a royal connection. Mount Kenya has an extra poignancy for the Queen because it was at the bottom of this same mountain 50 years ago that she, when she was on holiday as a princess with her husband at the Treetops Hotel, woke up one morning to discover that her father had died and she was now Queen. All that climbing can work up an appetite. Luckily, there's a mountain stream on hand to cool the refreshments. And all this had to be lugged up the mountain by the soldiers and some Kenyan porters. The local wildlife moves in for some scraps. Rock Hyrax enjoying their own Jubilee banquet. Andrew Harding, BBC News, on Mount Kenya. Now the main news again, the Queen's Golden Jubilee celebrations. And a short time ago, the Queen listened to a choir singing All You Need Is Love during her visit to Slough in Berkshire. And all that ahead of the launch of the BBC's Music Live festivities around the country. Well, that's all this Monday lunchtime. Enjoy your afternoon. One hundred TV cameras, two thousand musicians, two thousand five hundred carnival dancers. 20,000 performers, one queen, one big day. The BBC brings you the biggest party for 50 years. The Queen's Golden Jubilee, live tomorrow morning from 9.25 on BBC One. Now on BBC One, BBC London News with Mike Ramston. Good afternoon and welcome to BBC London News. Hyde Park is filling up as thousands of people head for central London to celebrate the Queen's Golden Jubilee. There's music this afternoon on five stages in the park as part of the BBC's Music Live event. Cordelia Kretschmar is there. What's happening at the moment, Cordelia? Well, there are now thousands of people here in Hyde Park and things are really livening up, as I can, you can hear, I'm sure. There are one of five stages. This is the Europe stage, each representing a different continent. And the music's been going here since 11 o'clock. I can hear Courtney Pine behind me now. And uh, there was even a game of football on stilts going on just to my left earlier. Can you believe it? So if the weather continues to hold out, it looks like we're in for a really great afternoon. No bank holiday line for these men, part of a small army of workers setting up in Hyde Park since 6.30 this morning. And not far behind them, the first of the crowds staking out the best spots. Well, people are arriving here in Hyde Park all the time. The attractions range right from the obvious, music from around the world, as you can hear, and the rather surprising. I'm here at the Australasia stage. Today is about music, music from around the Commonwealth. There are five stages around the Serpentine representing the five continents and we've got a whole range of musicians playing so it's just going to be a great day out with some really great free music it all kicked off at 11 o'clock Sibongile took the Africa stage for Australasia Mark Atkins drew a well-traveled crowd and Kadri came on for Asia it's just getting into the celebrations of the whole thing, really. Queen Jubilee, England World Cup, you know, and just to just chill out, really. 
We're just looking forward to the music, the African music, because we're missing home. We're from Cape Town, South Africa, and that's why we're here today, just to enjoy the music. For those members of the crowd who fancy having a go themselves, Kakazizi from Ghana are on hand for a bit of guidance. Cordelia Kretschmer, BBC London News. Well, I've grabbed Ali from out of the crowd to talk to us. He's come all the way down from Reading today. I'm sorry, it looks like you're missing the best bit of the performance. Can you tell me uh, what's brought you down here today? Well, I think the, the main attraction, obviously, is the music. There's five stages of uh, fantastic world music and uh, a lovely day to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee. And uh, people have turned out en masse to enjoy it, spotting with rain, but I don't think that's going to dampen any spirits. Of course, that is what it's all about. 50 years on the throne for the Queen. Is that something that means a lot to you and your friends? Tell me. Yeah, I, I think it means a lot to me and my friends, as, as it means a lot to uh, to everyone else in the country. It's uh, it's an important day, 50 years on the throne. It's something that we should all be proud of and celebrate and uh, enter in the spirit of things. Personally, I was born in the Silver Jubilee year, so uh, to celebrate here on my 25th year is uh, it's another big thing for me. So yes, it's a, it's important for us all, I think. Okay, well as you can hear, the crowds are loving Courtney Pine. I'm off to join them down the front. I'll catch up with you later, Mike. Thanks. BBC London has all the travel information to get you in and out of the capital over the Jubilee. And we're broadcasting live from the event as well. On radio today, BBC London 94.9 are in Hyde Park for BBC Music Live. Imran Khan and Sonia Deal featuring music from around the world on five stages, as you heard. Big names include Courtney Pine, you heard him there, and Lady Smith Black Mambazo. On TV, we'll be covering the Jubilee events in our later bulletins and have a special half-hour programme from Music Live with Brenda Emanis and Nina Hussain. That's at half past four on BBC One. And online, of course, we've got full listings of all events with maps showing road closures and the best ways to get around. If you are going into town, organisers are advising people to leave their cars at home as most of central London is closed to motorists. Roads around Buckingham Palace, Hyde Park, Victoria, Charing Cross and Sloan Square have been closed this afternoon to cars and lorries. Tomorrow, those closures spread further out, taking in almost all of central London and some areas south of the river. But extra buses and and tubes are being laid on. In fact, tubes are running all night tonight. For the latest, though, check the website. And the all-important weather for this afternoon, I'm afraid it is mixed news. Showers are likely this afternoon, as you saw, but they should have cleared by the time this evening's concert starts at Buckingham Palace. The top temperature, 19 degrees Celsius. That's a maximum this afternoon, but we've had a call from the Jubilee office asking people to wrap up warmly tonight and bring a brolly just in case. Tomorrow it should be dry and bright, but it will cloud over during the afternoon. And just before we go, congratulations to five youngsters from a school in Blackheath who have been at the heart of today's Jubilee celebrations. Extreme Impact, who all go to St Joseph's Academy, performed at the concert in Hyde Park, their prize for winning a competition run by BBC London 94.9. We'll have a special programme on BBC Music Live at half past four this afternoon featuring Extreme Impact, but for now, Goodbye.